this presentation. And please also mute yourselves while the presentation is going on. On behalf of the Boston Society for Architecture, welcome to tonight's presentation of Mass CEC's Triple Decker Design Challenge Submissions. I'm Jenny Efren. I'm the Policy Director for the Boston Society for Architecture, and we're excited to host tonight's event to highlight innovative design solutions to get the iconic Triple Decker to net zero carbon emissions. Triple or three deckers are one of the most predominant building types throughout Massachusetts, with an estimated 12,000 still existing today. Built en masse in the late 19th and earliest 20th centuries, they were often a point of entry into home ownership for immigrant families working in nearby factories. Typically, these are wood frame structures with three stacked units, hence triple, of identical floor plans with either flat or gabled roofs. In 2020, the BSA spent time speaking with Boston residents about their past and current experiences with triple deckers. And this exploration is currently a virtual exhibition, Future Decker, on our website. We've hosted a series of conversations along with the exhibition, including one in November around sustainability issues and opportunities for this building type. We hope you'll take a look at the exhibition and continue along with us as we consider what the next Triple Decker or Future Decker opportunity is throughout 2021. In collaboration with Boston's Housing Innovation Lab, we will be seeking ideas for designs and policy innovations that can unlock opportunities to create middle-scale affordable housing in the city. Please stay tuned for that. Tonight, we're excited to learn more about how this widely recognized building type can be retrofitted to the benefit of the occupant's health and to help get Massachusetts closer to its climate goals. There will be a presentation of the Triple Decker Challenge submissions and then a chance for Q&A with all of you. You can use the chat function to ask a question at any time throughout the program, and we will do our best to respond to those questions during the Q&A period. And with that, it is my great pleasure to introduce Kevin O'Connor, host of This Old House. Uh, thank you, Jenny, and good evening to everybody. Thank you all for joining this evening. It's uh, nice to be here, even if it is remote via Zoom. Uh, a special thanks to Mass EC for the invitation and for BSA for hosting the event and having me on this evening. I just want to spend hopefully no more than three or five minutes sort of kicking things off and then get to the matter at hand, which is the, uh, the challenge that we're all going to learn a lot about. First, I just want to, I want to say sort of a heartfelt congratulations to everyone involved, whether it's the contestants uh, who have submitted their proposals after lots of thought and planning, uh, information and knowledge, whether it's the folks who have helped organize the event, Mass EC, BSA, uh, or the folks who are here just to learn and to listen and to hopefully do what the point of this whole evening is, and that is to take these ideas and to digest them and spread them. Uh, you know, on, in my role as host of this old house, you can imagine we very frequently uh, come across cutting edge ideas and new technologies, corporations and builders, um, homeowners, scientists are bringing us these ideas all of the time. So we see lots of them, um, how to build homes better, how to make them more efficient, how to update our housing stock. Now, you might wonder what we think about a lot of those things and I will give you a little bit of an insight. The show is called This Old House. And uh, I, as much as anyone on the show, is very much focused with existing homes. And while we think it is awesome to show cutting edge, bleeding edge technology, um, to talk about how you can build a beautiful brand new net zero home, for example, um, we get most excited when we are dealing with how to work with the existing houses that we have. Um, you are not going to find or move your way forward to a sustainable future if we don't deal with the 100 to 120 million structures that exist currently. The houses we have are where the solutions, in our opinion, in my opinion, lie. Um, and so with that, I would just like to say congratulations to all of the folks who are taking on and tackling the hard work of renovating our existing housing stock. You could argue that this is where the problem is, if you defined it as a problem. 
um, whether it be carbon consumption or energy consumption, but it is definitely, definitely where the solution has to be. So the idea that there is a discussion talking about retrofitting existing houses and then specifically a type of house that is so prolific and so common to us here in Massachusetts and New England, um, I think is just critical. I absolutely, I absolutely think it's critical. Um, so I'm thrilled to be involved and I'm thrilled that this type of thing is going on. Uh, and I will also tell you um, that, you know, I, I have some personal experience with a triple decker having lived in one um, for several years. And as Jenny had mentioned in the introduction, these houses have provided a number of services for folks, whether it be bringing immigrant families into communities, whether it be providing first home ownership opportunities for people. Um, I, would add, I would add one thing to that list. I know it's, it's more comprehensive than those two examples, but I would add one thing to that list. The, the triple decker is also a very effective, a very efficient, a very flexible house um, for seven to 10 college students who happen to be jammed into one <laughs> during their college years, which is exactly my experience living in one for several years in Worcester, Massachusetts, uh, when I was at Holy Cross. And I will tell you that amongst all of its other features, um, it can not only hold a lot of young men, but it can expand on the weekends to hold many more. <laughs> Uh, the floor plan can be adopted so that kitchens can be turned into dance floors, living rooms can be turned into bar rooms, a whole bunch of crazy things you might imagine. So it's a very flexible house, near and dear to my heart, having lived in one for many years, and then after that three-decker on to more uh, as I moved my way through Boston before I finally bought my single-family home. So I know the form, uh, I appreciate the form, and I do think it is actually, it, it, it's a great place to, to talk about these types of things. I will also add that um, for our 30, 41st, our 41st season of this old house, we are renovating a three-decker, a triple-decker in Dorchester. Um, and so I am gonna uh, share my screen with you folks for just another minute or two and show you uh, a sneak peek. This is not on air yet. Uh, we are in the process of filming right now um, these episodes. So I'm going to pull some of this up, go to full screen and walk you through just a quick story of what we're working on. Um, this is a, a triple decker, Dorchester, Massachusetts, as I said, built in 1901. And it is, uh, it's actually, it's off of Columbia Avenue and it's less than a mile. It's about half a mile from Meeting House Hill in Dorchester which is the location of the very first This Old House project that we ever did uh, back in 1979. And as you might imagine, the form is very familiar. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of a closer look at it right there. There are the three deckers, there are the flat, there's the flat roof, there are the windows stacked in bays one over the other, there are the columns on the front. Um, so it's a very familiar form, very much like the ones that these contestants are all thinking about with regards to the challenge. Uh, built in 1901, putting it at about 120 years old, um, and our homeowner, Carol uh, Weidman, has lived there for 39 years. She moved into the house uh, back in 1981, and it served for her the exact same purposes that you know Jenny had laid out. Um, as a first time home buyer, this was the only way that Carol was gonna be able to afford a house. And that was to have one that had multiple opportunities for income. So it allowed her to get established in the neighborhood and she has been a fixture there for the last 39 years, has lived there continuously until July of 2020, when on July 4th, uh, there was a fire at the house next door, seen to the right here in this picture, just, just barely, you'll see more of it later. Um, their fireworks were going off on the 4th of July, the house on the right caught on fire, eventually the fire jumped over to her house, and the damage wasn't terrible, it was to the back corner, but it was substantial enough that she was out of the house, they were sleeping there at the time, the house was full, they all got out safely, but the house uh, was no longer livable. So she's been out of the house since July of last year. Um, she was living there with her sister, shown here, uh, but she also did what many people do with these homes. She raised her children 
and she lived with three generations uh, of her family, uh, all at some period during those 39 years. So a very familiar story. Um, the other thing that is familiar about this house that we are renovating. So this old house is now involved. This will be the second house of the current season and we will help Carol go back into the house, renovating it over the next six months to be on air on PBS um, probably by March. And there's just a couple pictures I wanna show you. I don't wanna belabor it. Um, we can always start with a great toilet shot. This, like so many three-deckers, um, is configured exactly the way you would expect it to be configured. There are three bathrooms right on top of each other. There is a central plumbing stack that makes it very efficient to build these houses very affordably with the pipes running up one wet wall, um, venting out through just a couple of pipes next to each other. There are kitchens on top of kitchens and the layout for each one of these floors is identical. Um, again, very efficient. It's also, it makes it relatively easy to renovate because we know exactly where everything is. And so long as we stay within that sort of configuration, um, we can work with the floor plan. Um, I show you this picture, you have to kind of, you kind of have to look in here and, and process it a little bit. I show you this picture because I think it speaks to both the legacy of these homes, but also to the challenges. What you are looking at here on the left are the vertical studs, the rough saw and two by fours. Um, but then that curved sort of corrugated elbow right there, that is an old air intercom. So it's just a tin pipe that you would speak through and you'd be able to talk to people on the second, third and first floors, as well as people outside. Just above that are the remnants of knob and tubing uh, electrical system, the white um, knobs right there, uh, and then the wires coming out of them. And then just above that is a steel pipe with another elbow and then a fixture on its opposite side. And that is a, a steel pipe for old city gas, um, which would have been a lighting source at the time. It's unknown to us exactly, but it is our belief that when this house was built, it was still at a transitional stage and no one wasn't certain which um, lighting source was going to prevail. Was it going to be the gas? Was it going to be the electric? And which one was going to be more, um, uh, which one was going to be more dependable? And so we believe that both of these were installed in this house at the same time. Um, they're still there. Um, these pipes are still going through all the walls. The fixtures are still coming out. Some of these fixtures have even been converted to our modern electrical systems. Uh, as well. And so it is a sort of a, a time capsule of how these houses have provided a service over their lifespans um, and have evolved. Um, and what I'm showing you here is another evolution. If you look at this built-in cabinet, and there are three of these in the house, one on each floor, to the left, you can see sort of a crooked gray pipe. That is eight to 10 inches um, of a heating pipe that because there was a coal bin in the basement um, and there was a gravity fed hot air system. One massive furnace uh, down in the basement fed by coal that let the air, the hot air just through gravity waft up through this home and come out through registers like you're seeing down there on the floor, that black iron register. Uh, that is the old heating system that was in this house. And Sadly, it really hasn't been upgraded to anything that much better. There are three old workhorses for the uh, domestic hot water. Uh, there are a couple furnaces that were put in that aren't very efficient in this house. Um, and this was just up until a year ago. So certainly better than an old um, coal bin in the basement. But this presents to, I think, anyone who looks at it, the challenges that we face with these homes. They are running off of these old systems. They are carbon-based systems. Um, are they efficient? Well, certainly in the grand scheme of things compared to the old coal systems, the old knob and tubing, the old street gas systems, sure, they're efficient. But are they where they should be or where they could be? Absolutely not. Um, and so these are some of the problems that we are going to be solving on the show. But writ large, these are the problems that the contestants who you're going to be hearing from tonight are going to be trying to solve because we will come in and do one of these. Um, who is going to do the other 11,999 that are remaining here in Massachusetts or the tens of thousands around the country or the hundreds of thousands of two families and single families who are suffering through a similar legacy? The legacy that we sometimes would like to celebrate, but also have to admit 
is also the legacy that is going to lead us to a very inefficient future. I share this final picture with you just to show you what our plans are for the house. Don't pay attention to the details because they are exactly the same on the first floor, the second floor, and the third floor. We are sticking with the formula of keeping the three floors identical one over the other. Carol uh, will live on one floor, her sister will live on another, and they will have other family members on the third or a rental income back in there. We're gonna keep it simple. We're gonna keep to the original form. Um, and we are going to keep the house sort of in its vernacular of where it used to be. That is the plan um, for the This Old House house for the current season, second half to air, as I say, in March and PBS. Um, and it is just fortuitous that we're doing it, probably the reason why I was invited to join you tonight. Uh, but I do think that it is a good lesson that we are going to share with our audience, um, and it is a similar lesson that you guys are probably going to hear tonight. What can we do with this housing type to make it more efficient? They are extremely durable homes. They are serving a purpose. They have served that purpose for well over 120 years in our city of Boston, in the state of Massachusetts. And I can say with pretty good confidence, with high certainty that they will continue to serve that purpose. The question for us is, in what form will they serve it? Will they serve it in the old fashioned way um, or will they serve it in a very futuristic and sustainable way? And it is our hope that it will be a futuristic and sustainable way, but we're not going to get there without a lot of hard thinking, hard work and common sense. And so I think that's what you're gonna be hopefully hearing later on in tonight's discussion. So I wanna again um, re-emphasize a congratulations to the folks who have put in the hard work to retrofit or think about retrofitting and restoring these old homes and to the rest of you who have shown an interest to be part of this conversation. Um, with that, I wish the contestants well. Uh, I thank you guys for joining us tonight and I especially thank you for the invitation. Uh, and with that, I will turn it uh, over to you, Steve. That's terrific. Thanks so much, uh, Kevin. Um, I'm Steve Pike. I'm the CEO of, of Mass CEC and just going to provide um, a bit of an overview as to um, uh, essentially why Mass CEC and the state are, are interested in, uh, in the work um, that's going on with, with triple deckers and, and encouraging more of it. Um, and uh, <clears throat> Kevin, you know, started to uh, to touch on on some of it. Um, but, uh, frankly, if if you have lived in an urban area in Massachusetts and haven't lived in a in a triple decker, I think you've really missed out on a life changing experience. Um, uh, having lived in them in in Somerville and Newton myself, um, and uh, and so I hope everybody has an opportunity to do that at some point in their uh, in their, in their life. Also want to thank, uh, Kevin and his efforts, uh, his whole team's efforts, the old house, uh, this old house team. Um, uh, I, I know it's a, a go-to resource, uh, for me. Um, his team has certainly demystified, um, uh, old buildings, um, and made, uh, construction and reno renovation techniques far more accessible for those folks like me who are, uh, not nearly as, as talented as, um, as he is um, being an owner of a, a house that uh, half of which was built roughly in 1730 and the, the other half of which was built in uh, 2003. It's, it's an interesting uh, combination and, and oftentimes a, a challenge when uh, you're trying to change anything. You may even notice behind me, um, not, uh, there's nothing square. Um, everything is, is at an angle um, uh, in this section of of the house. So thanks again uh, to Kevin. I want to thank uh, uh, Jenny and the Boston Society for Architecture uh, for collaborating with us on uh, on this event. Um, couldn't be doing it with um, without her. I want to thank um, the Bar Foundation. They're providing uh, financial support as um, as well as um, uh, overall guidance on on the program. Uh, the folks at the Department of Energy Resources who are working with us on uh, on our triple decker. Uh, program and, and last but certainly not least the Mass CEC team. So Gail and Nelson, uh, Beverly Craig, uh, Peter McPhee, uh, Jacqueline Guile as well from uh, from our team. Um, uh, they're the ones that are really pulling the the laboring oar on all this. I'm just the fortunate one that gets to uh, that gets to talk about it. 
So um, Mass CDC, for those of you that don't know, we're, we're really focused on, um, on driving technical innovation um, and kickstarting market transformation and, and transition in, in four key areas. One is buildings, um, and, uh, and we'll get into that a, a bit. The other three are transportation, uh, the grid as a whole, and, and offshore wind. Um, and this is a uh, this is a, a really auspicious time to be involved in in all of these issues um, in in Massachusetts. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, Governor Baker and his uh, administration, uh, led by uh, Secretary Theoharides at the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, released um, a couple of different documents. One is a, a uh, pathways document shows a general roadmap to achieving um, net zero carbon. Uh, reductions by 2050. The other document is uh, nearer term. Um, it's a, uh, a clean energy and climate plan for 2030. So it, uh, it sets out um, the plan that gets us uh, to a reduction by 2030 that puts us on a path to achieving the, the overall 20, uh, the 2050 reductions. Um, a, a really aggressive, um, aggressive plan and um, as Kevin touched on, existing buildings are, are really a key element um, of that plan. The building sector as a whole um, is critical to, uh, to solving in order for us to achieve um, our 2050 goals. And I think of those, you know, of all of the areas and, um, and certainly the, the four areas that we're focused on, I, I would say that uh, buildings is probably the most um, the most challenging. Um, it is going to involve uh, millions of buildings, as you can see here. Um, uh, you know, at least over over two million. Probably by the time 2050 rolls around, close to uh, three million. They all have a variety of different um, physical characteristics. They have different um, ownership structures. They're used for um, for a variety of um, of different purposes. And so, um, you know, while we know that um, a fair bit of attention is paid to, to new construction, um, I think as, you know, as Kevin was, was getting to, really the, the much larger challenge is with existing, um, with existing buildings. Uh, and so what is, um, what's that transformation going to uh, involve? And uh, right when we got on this evening, uh, we had a, um, an attendee, you know, ask whether or not that involves um, electrifying the buildings. It certainly does, and every aspect um, of our buildings. Um, you know, moving away from from fossil fuels for space heating, for water heating, for cooking, um, for our, our personal transport, um, and the like. And uh, on top of that, most of the buildings, and again, you can see from uh, from the pictures that uh, Kevin put up. Uh, these buildings are going to need, um, in addition to a change out of, of equipment, you're going to need a really deep um, weatherization. What that's going to do is not only reduce that, uh, the energy demand over the long haul, but also uh, dramatically reduce the costs, um, the day-to-day -day operating costs uh, of, these, um, of these buildings. And I mentioned um, the number of buildings in Massachusetts, and I mentioned the 2030 plan. Uh, the 2030 CEC plan calls for uh, essentially the full electrification and deep weatherization of 1 million residential buildings in Massachusetts. Um, so uh, perhaps needless to say, we really need to pick up um, kind of our pace of play we're doing maybe a few hundred, let's be generous to ourselves, a few thousand um, per year. Um, do the quick math, we need to be averaging 100,000 uh, residential uh, buildings every year for the next 10 years, um, which means uh, obviously there's going to be a ramp up the back end of, of this decade. Um, we're going to have to be doing uh, probably hundreds of thousands uh, annually in order to achieve um, the, uh, the 2030 um, benchmarks. We're also going to need to uh, really to keep an eye on embodied carbon and uh, probably most of you are, are familiar with that term. For those of you that aren't, it's, it's really the emissions um, that are required to, you know, to produce all of the 
uh, appliances that go into the um, into the the homes and the buildings, the refrigerants, the insulation, um, the the cladding, doors, windows, um, and so on. Those obviously require um, uh, uh, manufacturing, and um, and there are emissions that um, that come with the production of of all of those products. Um, and that's an area that over time we're going to need to uh, going to need to tackle as well. Um, and we know that, um, you know, that we need to really need to meet building owners um, sort of where they are, whether they're renovating a, a single family home, um, um, as, as I and many others have done, whether we're uh, working on a, a triple decker as, um, as Kevin is doing, um, or whether it's a, you know, a, a 300,000 square foot office tower. Um, we need folks, we need to help folks identify uh, the path forward. Um, when and how can they do it? What are, uh, what are the cost effective solutions um, going to be so that when they are uh, facing a situation where um, uh, something has failed on them, they are in a position to replace that, um, that equipment or that portion of a building, um, the new roof, siding, what have you, uh, with a with a, a product and a building technique um, that puts them in a position to be 2050 um, compliant, and uh, and I think that this um, you know this is particularly challenging, or or one of the reasons that buildings are particularly challenging is that those opportunities don't come around um, every day. Um, you know, it's I think it's very useful to. Um, to compare it to cars. And so oftentimes what we look at is, is um, when we're referring to, you know, sort of meeting building owners or meeting um, car owners where they are, uh, is looking at these, uh, the sort of the turnover rates, right? How, um, how frequently do folks go out and replace their car? How frequently do they go out and replace their boiler or furnace, their dryer, so on and so forth. As you can see here, uh, typically, a car is, is replaced every um, every seven years or so. Um, that's a very rapid uh, turnover rate as compared to your typical um, really crucial pieces of, um, of an existing uh, building. Oftentimes, it's uh, 15 to, you know, to 20 to 30 years. Uh, for these other pieces um, of equipment. And needless to say, the buildings themselves, um, as you could hear from the triple decker or, or the building that's around me now, they can be around for centuries. Um, and so these opportunities um, come around fairly infrequently. And so it's extremely important that we start working now so that we do not miss those opportunities uh, that do arise over the next, uh, over the next 30 years or so. And that's part of what Mass CEC is, is trying to do, is to prepare uh, the, um, the market suppliers as well as um, the market buyers. Uh, so that could be in this case, uh, homeowners and then those that, that supply homeowners um, and contractors with the, uh, with the equipment and uh, the materials that go into uh, retrofitting a home uh, with those materials in a in a in a sort of in a package that is um, that is cost effective um, upfront and cost effective uh, over the long haul that also helps us achieve those 2030 and 2050 um, goals. And so the the triple triple decker design challenge is focused on, as Kevin was saying, a um, a a particularly. I mean, it's. It, on the one hand, it's a very simple building, and on the other hand, it's a very complex building. It's one that is um, is pretty simple to uh, understand and to manage and maintain, and maintain. But to um, transition it to a building that is um, what we'd like to think of as 2050 uh, compliant is um, is a really uh, is a really challenging undertaking. Um, they also have a, a variety of, of different ownership um, structures and arrangements. Um, in some cases, they're owner-occupied, as the one uh, Kevin was, um, was, is working on. 
Um, in other cases, there's third party ownership. In other cases, it's a, you know, it's multi party ownership in a condominium um, uh, arrangement or, um, or what have you. So, um, so as much work has been going on with, with triple deckers, what we do know is that typically that work doesn't go nearly deep enough, as I mentioned, to, um, uh, to become 2050 compliant. And that's what, um, that's what this design challenge is all about. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the more um, encouraging um, sort of outcomes of, of the work that we've done to date is, uh, is not only that are we figuring out um, how to retrofit these buildings in a 2030 and 2050 compliant um, manner, but uh, what it's also doing is improving uh, occupant health and comfort. Um, a third uh, outcome that we've seen in, in similar situations is a sense of community value, uh, which is to say once folks um, uh, start living in buildings uh, like this, they take far more pride in where they live, not just that actual structure, but also uh, the, larger, uh, the larger community. We see that particularly in uh, affordable housing uh, communities. And so this is uh, this design challenge is, is really is, is just the first step. Um, and uh, it's a very important step. We need to get the conversation going. We need to actually surface um, uh, plans that can be uh, executed on. And then the next step, of course, is um, we need to start putting some of um, some of these plans into play. Um, really figure out whether or not the the projected results bear out um, in the real world, both from a, um, a performance uh, perspective as well as uh, from a cost perspective. And so that's where, uh, so uh, kicking all of this off is, um, is where we're situated now with, um, with the challenge. Um, just some, some real quick details on this. Um, we'll be awarding three first place prizes, uh, $25,000 uh, each one for a design uh, that retrofits an existing uh, triple decker, uh, one for a design that uh, retrofits and then adds a unit. And so this you'll often see or hear uh, as referred to as a, a three plus proposal. Um, so the, the three decks plus uh, something additional. Uh, and then one for a design um, uh, uh, that has brought their own triple decker um, into, uh, into the mix. We'll also be doing uh, awarding four fifteen thousand uh, dollar runner up prizes, a fifteen thousand or five thousand dollar excuse me uh, student prize, and a ten thousand dollar people uh, people's choice prize. And that's where all of you uh, get to weigh in and uh, let us know what you think um, is uh, is the top choice. We also, we aren't doing this alone by any means. Um, we, uh, in addition to, uh, to Jen and the, and the BSA, um, and of course uh, the Bar Foundation and uh, DOER, uh, we also have a panel uh, of judges. And I, I just wanna give um, uh, them a quick shout out here. Andrea Mosier from uh, National Grid, Chris Mazzola from Home Energy Raiders, uh, Michael Berry from ICF, Peter Clint, uh, from Eversource, uh, Rachel Lane from Royer uh, Architects and Taylor Kane from uh, the city of Boston. So thanks to each of you for, um, for the time that you uh, are spending on this and, uh, and the assistance that you're lending uh, to MassCC. Really, uh, really appreciate it. Re appreciate having those, those outside and diverse um, uh, perspectives. So um, at this point, I think that that's probably uh, enough, uh, enough from me. Um, I think what, um, what we're gonna to turn to next is uh, taking a look at um, a subset of the 13 proposals uh, that we've received. I believe you can find all 13 um, on our website uh, and or through the uh, BSA's um, uh, website and um, uh, would certainly ask you, you know, should you have questions, feel free to, um, to fire away in the chat. We'll be doing a little uh, Q&A um, &A at the end. 
Uh, and I do want to put in a, just another quick plug for the uh, People's Choice Award. I gather we have uh, over 700 uh, voters already in the system. So uh, looking to each of you, if, if you haven't uh, taken a look and, and, uh, and, um, uh, and checked your box, please do that. Uh, really would welcome your, uh, your participation in, um, in that process. Uh, and so with that, I think that the, uh, we're gonna have a few uh, uh, videos and, and presentations over the next uh, 30 to 45 minutes, and then we'll, um, we'll uh, circle back for uh, just some closing, uh, closing thoughts uh, at the end of the evening. Thanks again uh, to each of you for joining. Uh, really interested in, in your feedback and, uh, and gratefully for your participation as well. Thanks, Steve. Hi, everyone. I'm Jacqueline Guile with Mass EEC. And as Steve mentioned, uh, we're gonna go through some videos from the applicants. And then for any applicants that were not able to submit a video, we'll show you their poster and some basic features of their design. Um, and as Steve mentioned, we'd love for you to put any questions into the chat or any of the features of the designs that you really like. Uh, we'd love to hear from you on what you think is especially great for triple deckers. So this is the, uh, the first design called Making Sense of Carbon, uh, created by Demela Schaefer and R.W. Sullivan as a consultant. This triple decker retrofit design seeks to prove that a carbon drawdown building is feasible and cost effective with existing technology and construction techniques by testing a replicable design and modeling approach, which prioritizes a low infiltration, passive house envelope, thermal comfort, and resiliency. They have an estimated construction cost of 326,000. They've achieved a 92 decrease in the annual energy use bringing the HERS rating from 15, or from 176 to 15. 2,200 kilograms of CO2 embodied carbon emissions are emitted in this proposed building materials. They've installed a solar PV array of 10 kilowatts, and they are proposing a VRF heat pump for heating and cooling and a heat pump water heater for hot water. Next, I'm gonna play the video from Zephyr Architects on their Triple Decker Retrofit Toolkit. Hello, I am Josh Smith, Director of Sustainability at Zephyr Architects. I'd like to introduce introduce you to Zephyr Architects' submission for Mass CEC's Triple Decker Retrofit Challenge, our Retrofit Toolkit. Renovations are complicated things. They need to address a wide variety of problems, their scope and budget are difficult to control, and they involve complex decisions between competing products and design solutions. When looking at the iconic Boston Triple Decker, there is no one-size-fits-all solution that would accommodate the varied conditions of the existing buildings, the budgets of the homeowners, and the extent of work each project is looking to tackle. Rather than provide a single proposed design then, our approach to this problem is to provide a kit of tools to help homeowners and contractors decide the most effective ways to renovate their buildings. We take into account immediate factors such as cost and disruption to occupants of the building, as well as longer term considerations like return on investment, lifetime energy performance, and environmental benefit. Our first tool, the Matrix, provides a quick overview of all options, while more in-depth information is available in the guide and eventually in the app. The Matrix is a comprehensive chart that breaks down the building into components and gives the best available renovation options for each one. Moving from the roof down and outside in, this matrix allows building owners to select which areas need the most attention, what the simplest or most costly intervention options are, and what changes will give homeowners the largest impact. Consistent graphic indicators showing cost, energy performance, and other factors allow for easy comparison between options. Selected options can then be traced together into a coherent retrofit path. While the matrix provides an overview of available options, our second tool, the guide, gives in-depth knowledge on each component. Breaking down the component areas into specific interventions and products, this expanded information on systems, installation methods, and environmental impacts 
helps users understand the differences between competing options. This allows homeowners to make informed decisions on which path best suits their building and their budget. Real-world examples and links to technical resources allow homeowners to do further research to inform their decisions. While currently being developed as a booklet, we see the future of this toolkit as a digital application that takes the existing conditions of a user's building into account, guides them through options for each area of possible building renovation, and dynamically tracks the total cost, embodied carbon, and energy performance of all choices. This interactive manual will simplify the retrofit decision process, making it feel manageable to any homeowner while also making it flexible enough to be applied to a wide variety of existing buildings. Thank you for taking a look at Zephyr Architects Triple Decker Challenge Retrofit Toolkit. Check out this and our other projects online at www.zephyr-a.com. Thanks. So this is well, the... Good evening, everyone. My name is oh, Robert I'm sorry. Williams. I'm a registered architect, certified pass consultant, and an assistant. Sorry about that. Um, so this is the poster for uh, Design Build Boston Construction's uh, Triple Decker Deep Energy Retrofit Design. This triple decker retrofit design focuses on providing the owners the renovation tools necessary to achieve a net zero home with a concentration on the tenant benefits. They have an estimated construction cost of 405,000, achieve an 80% decrease in the annual energy use, bringing the HERS rating from 173 to 34, 18,000 kilograms of carbon are emitted um, in embodied carbon emissions. They're installing an 18 kilowatt solar PV array, and they're proposing ductless air source heat pumps for heating and cooling, and electric hot water heater for the hot water. Next, I'm gonna play uh, Util's Plugin Plus video. Plugin Plus is a proposal for a resilient, replicable, all-electric retrofit for existing triple-deckers. Many existing triple-deckers are drafty with minimal to no insulation. Critical building systems are typically located in the basement, making them vulnerable to coastal, riverine, and stormwater flooding. Our proposal introduces a plugin designed to elevate systems above grade making them easy to maintain without disturbing residents. Plus, it also provides a range of additional benefits. Plugin Plus also uses an outside-in approach to the envelope so that residents can stay in their homes during construction. New continuous insulation and sheathing are added to the roof and walls. Triple glazed windows are installed and air sealed and the building is re-roofed and clad. This wall section shows the new work. The yellow shows new insulation with a red line representing a continuous air and thermal control layer, which greatly enhances comfort and reduces heating costs. An important next step is to compartmentalize the apartments. This will improve indoor air quality and sound control. To do this, a blower door test will be conducted to guide the air sealing of any gaps and penetrations through the walls, floors, and ceilings. New air source heat pumps provide all electric efficient heating and cooling to each apartment. Ductless units are located along the exterior wall and refrigerant drain and power lines run behind the new insulation to minimize work on the interior. The plug-in contains highly insulated electric water heaters that replace the gas-fired ones in the basement. A centralized energy recovery ventilator, also located in the plug-in, supplies filtered outdoor air to each living space through compact ductwork. Stale air is extracted at kitchens and bathrooms. Centralized water heating and ventilation represent a predictable load on the owner's electric meter. This load matches the estimated annual production of a 9 kilowatt solar photovoltaic system. Tax credits, incentives, and a loan would translate to significant savings. The plug-in can offer additional benefits beyond the new mechanical systems. It can be modified to host a variety of other functions that the homeowner may choose, such as a compost bin or a water cistern to collect stormwater for a new vegetable garden. Seating can be created to host people in the yard. The plug-in can be customized as a play area or an EV charging station for electric car owners. 
It can also make a beautiful bay window with planters and become a venue for live music events. Or simply store your bike. Can you imagine other options for your plugin? As triple deckers are converted to plug-in plus homes, neighborhoods become more sustainable, resilient, and vibrant places to live. So the next one is uh, this designed by Sustainable Energy Analytics. The future is electric. This triple decker retrofit design focuses on improving the building envelope through reducing infiltration, proper compartmentalization, and increasing insulation while also utilizing high efficiency systems. They have an estimated construction cost of 529,000 and achieve a 79% decrease in the annual energy use with a HERS rating change of 297 to 34. This design actually sequesters carbon in the embodied carbon emissions, sequestering 261 kilograms of CO2. They are not proposing solar PV as part of their proposal, but the roof is designed to be solar ready for the future. Their design uses ductless air source heat pumps for heating and cooling and a heat pump hot water heater for hot water. This is the video for University of Math Massachusetts Amherst, refacing the future deep energy retrofits for the next century. Good evening, everyone. My name is Robert Williams. I'm a registered architect, certified pass-fast consultant, and an assistant professor in the Department of Architecture at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. Our team also includes Dr. Isla Examia, an associate professor in the Department of Architecture at UMass Amherst, and Travis Anderson from Place Taylor Design Build in Boston. Our proposal aspires to respect the legacy and value of the triple decker typology in urban New England, while also updating it to ensure its viability for at least another 100 years. And we recognize, recognize, like many others in this competition, that triple deckers represent a significant opportunity for decarbonization within Massachusetts and greater New England. Our approach to the retrofit centers on three key principles. First is to focus retrofit strategies on the exterior of the building while minimizing interior renovations to every extent possible. This reduces cost, minimizes disruptions, and maintains ample flexibility for future renovations. And towards this end, we're proposing that the building be wrapped in a continuous thermal and air barrier to the exterior of the existing sheeting. Second, the proposal relies on an innovative thermoelectric facade system to provide heating, cooling, and energy generation. Thermoelectric facades are novel facade systems developed over the past five years at UMass Amherst by Dr. Examia and collaborators. These systems incorporate thermoelectric modules into the facade system itself. When coupled with electronic controllers, these through wall modules provide highly efficient and localized thermal management. While not being used to actively heat or cool the interior space, the modules can utilize temperature gradients to generate electricity. In keeping with our first principle, the heating and cooling system is limited to the, limited to the facade itself and does not require any interior ducting, piping, or other equipment. This makes these novel thermoelectric facade systems ideal for energy efficient retrofits of historic building stock. The third guiding principle is to maximize the use of recycled materials to both reduce the embodied carbon and respect the history of these buildings. For instance, in this proposal, we're relying almost exclusively on recycled polyiso for insulation. Recycled polyiso is readily available in New England and has one of the highest R values per inch of common insulation products. We also imagine using some salvaged materials for the exterior claddings or other applications. Per the Mass CEC calculations, our proposal achieves a 95% decrease in annual, annual energy use with a HERS rating of nine. The embodied carbon is only 8,500 kilograms, while the estimated construction cost comes in around $330,000. Taken together, our approach yields a very efficient 
low carbon strategy that is practical, scalable, and affordable. Thank you all very much. And thank you to the Mass CEC for organizing this exciting and important competition. So next we have uh, Leopold Brown Goldback Architects and Scott Payette Architects design outside in, inside out. So um, this retrofit design emphasizes maximizing quality of life and increasing property values through three minimal intelligent interventions, creating additional indoor and outdoor living spaces, tightening the building envelope, and eliminating operational costs with on-site photovoltaic panels. They have an estimated construction cost of $331,000. They achieve an 104% decrease in annual energy use, bringing the HERS rating from 173 to negative seven. Their proposal admits 1,600 kilograms of embodied carbon emissions. They're installing an 18.2 kilowatt solar PV array and are proposing ductless air source heat pumps for the heating and cooling and a heat pump water heater for the hot water. Next, we'll play the video from Opal Global, who did a wood fiber modular encapsulation. Hi, my name is Matt O'Malley, and I'm an architect with Opal Architecture, and I'm also a co-founder of GoLab. We're a startup manufacturing wood fiber insulation right here in Maine. When we became aware of the Triple Decker Challenge, we were really excited because it's asking such an important question. Residential energy accounts for 20% of all CO2 related emissions in the US. And in order to address the climate crisis, we need a solution that addresses the residential energy, energy, energy consumption. The second thing is, there are a lot of houses out there. There are 139 million houses and apartments, 38 percent of which were built before 1970. Upgrading the walls and attic insulation of these residential buildings alone would reduce CO2 emissions by 575 million metric tons annually, cutting housing share of total U.S. emissions in half. So when we're thinking about a solution for the triple decker, what we really wanted to focus on was something that was scalable, flexible, and cost effective, something that could be implemented not only in Boston for the triple decker here, but residential structures across the US, United States. And so flexibility accommodating the unique conditions of existing buildings was critical and foremost. The second thing is that we had to have a solution that could be applied to the exterior because we can't ask 139 million families to leave their homes for a month or two while we go about renovating and upgrading the existing housing stock in the US. That's just not realistic. So we needed an exterior solution. Three, we needed a, a solution that had good building science behind it. Specifically, if we're gonna encapsulate these buildings in insulation, that insulation needs to be vapor permeable to allow moisture to breathe out of the buildings and not get trapped, causing mold mildew, and worst of all, possibly bad indoor air quality for the occupants. So we can't save energy, but make a huge indoor air quality issue for people going forward. That's just not a good trade-off. And finally, fourth, the key is that we need to use an insulation and other building materials that come to the job site with a carbon negative footprint. Because if we use conventional insulation, foam and fiberglass to do this renovation, while we'll be saving um, energy the day that we install that insulation, the problem is to pay for the carbon footprint of those materials, it will take 10 years of operational energy savings. And quite frankly, we do not have 10 years to wait to have the benefit uh, realized of adding insulation. So we're proposing using wood fiber insulation. It's been made in Europe for 25 years. It's renewable, recyclable, non-toxic, it's vapor permeable, so there will be no building moisture issues. And finally, it's carbon sequestering. So it comes to the job, the job site with a carbon negative footprint. So the energy that it saves, you realize on day one. And that's critical to address the climate crisis quickly, timely, and efficiently. Thank you very much. So the last uh, retrofit design we have for you is from a group of students at MIT 
Uh, it's called Zero, Zero Admissions Retrofit Optimization. This triple decker retrofit design focuses on making a net zero renovation as compelling as possible to an owner by aligning the project incentives with their tenants and providing the most cost efficient solution. They have an estimated construction cost of 247,000. 2,800 kilograms of CO2 are emitted in embodied carbon emissions. They're proposing a 17.1 kilowatt solar PV array and they're proposing air to water heat pumps for heating, cooling, and hot water. Next, we're gonna move on to the submissions that proposed adding an additional unit to the building. So this is the submission from ZH Architects called Boston Hip. So next, I'm gonna turn it over to Katie Faulkner, a member of the Fort Hill Triple Decker Design Team. Um, he's gonna tell you a little bit about their project. Hi, can you hear me okay? My, my trusty microphone kicked out right before this. So yes, you hear me? Great, you. thank you so much. Thanks, Jacqueline. Thanks for putting up with my slides. Um, this has been a fantastic experience. We brought our own triple decker to this. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. 
Um, and the reason for doing that is that I have the ambition to renovate um, a triple decker and actually do a fair amount of what this project proposes to do in terms of the deep energy retrofit. So we focus very much on the business case and finances for actually doing this to try to figure out the most cost effective way to do it, looking at the zoning constraints and recognizing the kinds of upgrades that get triggered when you start to do these kinds of projects, um, as we saw from some of the earlier uh, photographs that they're usually inside. It's quite a uh, historical story in there of knob and tube and old wires and et cetera. So really trying to take a full look at the finances. So uh, we partnered, Wes Faulkner uh, is a small firm we just launched this year and we partnered with Place Taylor with some great support from Resonant Energy looking at a specific Fort Hill triple decker and proposing, and you can go to the next slide, a um, both a deep energy retrofit and an added unit on top, as well as trying to come up with a financial model with the, what we'll call district solar to help offset the costs for the renovation and the upgrade. And I can't say that we necessarily hit all of our goals, but I'll tell you what we did and how, how we got there. Next slide, please. So as you've seen in some of the others, it seemed so important to be able to renovate the building in a way that would not cause tenants to have to leave, at least not for an extended period of time. So with that, we looked at large 10 by 20 foot insulated panels that could be crane lifted using the same poly ISO that was referred to in an earlier presentation. But one of the things we decided was to only do this on three sides. The triple deckers generally have almost a Victorian facade that is really charming and so important, I think, to the vernacular of New England that we didn't want to spoil that. And we found with our energy model that we did not really uh, decrease performance tremendously by not doing that fourth facade. So we have kind of a blanket, if you will, on three sides that includes not only the isolation, but a rain screen layer, siding, and then uh, tilt turn windows, all of which come in a 10 by 20 panel and then can be assembled on site. Next slide, please. We're also proposing a modular unit on the top. Most triple deckers, which are built with old growth timber that tend to be ganged up, have the ability to support a fourth floor addition if the weight is distributed evenly, if the primary point loads come down on the exterior so that you can carry structure all the way down to the foundation. So the thinking here was to develop a series of modulars 12 by 32 feet, four, four of which are generally pretty standard and general and come in um, components that are assembled offsite and framed in, one of which then becomes more of a utility pod and that one has a kitchen kit and a bath kit as well as the ERV and um, hot water system for the entire unit. So the thinking is that can be assembled rather quickly. Again, you, uh, occupants would be required to leave for the installation, but the thinking is that this can be done in a matter of days, not weeks or months. Next slide, please. Finally, thinking in terms of the finances, we came up with the concept of the solar district. In Fort Hill, there are approximately 75, so, uh, 75 triple deckers that would be eligible for this kind of retrofit. If, for example, we could get gang them in groups of 25, if we could then cover them with solar panels, we could create a tremendous amount of energy that could be metered in what we call in front of the meter so that that could be harvested by a third party buyer and potentially elevate or uh, accelerate the speed of the payback for not only the cost of the PV array, but the, cut, the construction of the fourth floor addition as well. Next slide, please. So in an ideal world, this is what the neighborhood looks like. There's no one size fits all for triple deckers as we've talked about. They would all need to be renovated in a custom way, but with a kit of parts that could be used for a variety of triple deckers. In addition, the addition itself, as long as it meets the criteria of the point loads, and is uh, optimized for its solar orientation can have a variety of configurations, thus preserving, I think, the unique identity of the triple decker and allowing people to develop homes that suit their needs. Again, this may be an expanded third floor unit to allow people to stay and have and grow their families, or it may be a fourth unit that brings much needed rental income 
to again help pay for the cost of the upgrade. So finally on this next slide, just to kind of summarize the notion of our sorry how we're doing it. Uh, there's some there is some interior uh, renovation, we do need the center corridors of each unit to do the uh, heating and cooling. There is an energy pod that is comprised of an ERV and mini splits which goes on the porch and those feed into the existing units. And then there's solar water solar water heating for the fourth floor unit. The basement uh, hot water heaters are simply upgraded to be attached to the solar uh, hot water system. We're trying not to replace everything. So to manage costs, we would simply upgrade that system. And I'll finally, I know I'm exceeding my three minutes. So let's go to the final slide. Thank you so much. So again, we were looking at a renovation cost of about 267,000 267,000 for the addition, 287,000 for the deep energy retrofit. With the mass save, with the tax rebates, you can offset that a little, but there is just no sugar coating. This is a very expensive undertaking. It can be paid back with the system that we're proposing, but let's be honest, a 30 year payback is not likely to be appealing to a single homeowner. So we're looking for people like community development corps who may own several of these who might see this as a reasonable business case, which certainly pays for itself and has a greater good, but also doesn't bear an undue financial burden for all of the requirements of the upgrade. And with that, thank you so much. Great, thanks Katie. Uh, so next is the Merge Architects, uh, the Backstack design. The purpose of the triple decker design challenge is to identify replicable, scalable, all electric approaches to retrofitting uh, existing triple deckers, our region's iconic three family dwelling. Merge is a practice focused on finding opportunities and invention in the ordinary, really working within the so called DNA of a given vernacular, especially when it comes to housing. So the Triple Decker Challenge for us was a really exciting chance to reinvent this iconic typology for Boston and the surrounding areas. We started the challenge by investigating the 3 plus retrofit design track. We were not only interested in developing improvements to the existing triple decker building, but by adding an additional unit, we will be able to address the growing housing needs of Boston and provide potential income to offset the overall construction cost. So where do we locate the additional unit? We knew we wanted to preserve the three-story massing to continue to fit into its neighborhood context. We wanted to keep costs related to tenant relocation low, and we wanted to be mindful of climate change as it relates to the rising sea levels. Ultimately, this led to the design of the additional unit in the back of the building. Because of its footprint, we wanted to organize the unit vertically and replace the existing spiral stair with a spatially efficient scissor stair. One stair path serves as a circulation for the new unit, and the second stair path provides better egress for the existing tenants, but more importantly, an opportunity for a rare community space on the roof deck. By slightly shifting the three stack volumes, it not only gives the building a contemporary reading, but also carves out generous open porches for the existing tenants. Another advantage of the vertically organized unit is a central void that was inserted to act as a passive stack ventilation. It operates with a combination of cross ventilation from the windows and the opera skylight at the roof. And the skylight also allows for natural daylight to cascade down along the stairwell, encouraging less energy use. In addition to the natural ventilation, the green engineers suggested the use of energy recovery ventilators that will work in tandem pairs to capture waste heat from the exhaust air and transfer it to the supply air. We specified ductless air source heat pumps for heating and cooling. This system has many advantages, including a minimally invasive installation and the ability to be powered by solar energy. Paired with the tilted solar panels on the roof, the cost to run the ductless air source heat pumps will be reduced significantly. In addition, we specified more efficient heat pump domestic hot water heaters, ductless heat pump dryers, and Energy Star electric stoves. In consideration of the overall embodied energy of the retrofit, we proposed reusing the existing double pane vinyl windows, which were already in good condition and had good U values, thereby saving them from landfills. To further reduce the overall energy loads for the new heating and cooling systems, we at ThoughtForms proposed putting an air barrier on the outside of the sheathing, and instead of the typical two inches, installing four inches of insulation, which is a pretty minimal cost increase compared to the improvement in thermal performance. The result is a well-insulated and tighter building with lower energy bills and improved comfort. 
These strategies, consisting of widely available solutions, are crucial steps toward reducing emissions and operating on 100% renewable energy in the future. There's something really important about addressing this with the challenge that's given to us by Mass DEC because it's a very prevalent typology around Massachusetts and Boston. This competition was saying there's you know, thousands of these triple-deckers in the area. Even though the scale of the individual buildings is small, the sum of the impact of all those buildings put together is pretty big. We believe our proposal would take the iconic triple-decker building typology into the future in a contemporary way. It's an attractive solution for an efficiently run, low-carbon emitting, healthy home and living that we can enjoy and be proud of. And finally, the last submission we have for you. is for draw architecture and urban designs, uh, draw a triple decker. This triple decker design building keeps true to its historical characteristics. With a renovated multifaceted facade system, the building quickly becomes state of the art. The treated timber facade will feature solar heating technology and house all season patios for all of its levels. The features on its west facade will incorporate the same language as the front. It integrates a hidden gutter for rainwater harvesting and extends its views and circulation. This allows for more usable square footage inside. The structure will also allow for more privacy from its southern neighbor. On the roof, we have over 90 solar panels and a new water collection system that will allow for rainwater harvesting. This is Draw's triple decker design. Thank you. So that was all of the designs and you can read more about the designs and look at the posters in more detail on our website. We'd encourage everyone to vote for our People's Choice Award. Voting closes this Sunday, uh, so make sure to look at the designs and get your answers in by then. I'm going to turn it over to Galen Nelson to wrap up. Great. Thanks, thanks Jacqueline. Great job um, walking us all um, through that. <clears throat> and thanks to all of you for your attention and participation tonight. I'm just going to try and um, quickly uh, tie this all up and offer some um, brief high-level conclusions. Um, so reviewing and, and considering all these applications with our um, panel of evaluators, whom I'd really love to thank again, uh, really um, enjoyed and appreciate their, their input. Uh, we were reminded that while triple-deckers have some you know, really charming qualities, uh, as, as Kevin noted at the, at the top um, of the event, uh, there's substantial room for improvements, uh, specifically uh, from an energy and uh, building occupant uh, perspective. Uh, many triple deckers are simply uh, drafty, inefficient uh, energy hogs and climate liabilities. Um, but this exploration also reminded us of some of the recurring challenges uh, to decarbonizing existing triple deckers. Um, and I'll just list a few. Uh, many triple deckers, uh, as we saw from some of um, the early shots that uh, Kevin shared, uh, are full of uh, basements that are cluttered with existing piping and wiring, and in some cases, hazardous materials, including asbestos, knob and tube wiring, and other challenges that complicate uh, insulation and air sealing efforts. Um, flat roofs uh, were referenced several times, are found on not all, but many triple-deckers, uh, present some really technically um, uh, technical challenges as far as uh, insulating and air sealing is concerned. Um, uh, as we also contemplate properly managing moisture uh, and then uh, changing kind of categories entirely of consideration, the interests of tenants and, um, and building owners are often not aligned. So lots of challenges, um, but that all said, um, I think we, what we saw a lot of here and what you'll see if you actually look at um, uh, the posters and read the details, um, we are really happy to see that applicants uh, recognize the cultural significance of the triple decker and how they contribute to com community cohesion, interaction at the street level to community health, the, the fabric of our neighborhoods. Um, 
the, uh, the applicants also recognized by and large that the solutions for decarbonizing these buildings and many um, existing um, buildings uh, exist today uh, and they can be implemented cost effectively. And of course, those, um, some of those key strategies include electrification and energy efficiency improvements. Uh, we saw some interesting experimentation with modular exterior high performance siding systems, which we're very happy to see. And we think we need to continue to learn more and experiment uh, with those types of solutions. Uh, but it's important to note that we also saw a lot of just thoughtful targeted high quality insulation and air sealing uh, that allows um, building owners to keep existing uh, siding. Um, and so that's also an important um, observation. Um, I, I think all, nearly all the applicants agreed that solar PV on the roof of a triple decker is almost always a good investment given existing market prices and incentive structures. Um, we did see some really interesting and novel solutions to addressing the landlord tenant split incentive, which of course is a widely recognized persistent barrier to completing clean energy upgrades in uh, multifamily buildings. And I would note in larger commercial buildings. Um, we were really happy to see um, that uh, many of the proposals um, emphasize pretty dramatic improvements in uh, existing ventilation uh, in triple deckers, which was important before 2020, but particularly in light of COVID and other possible future uh, pandemics, uh, contagious diseases, um, a new and welcome focus on uh, building occupant health uh, that we often only see in, in larger buildings. Uh, we were, of course, very excited about the proposals that included additions of a fourth unit to an existing triple decker, which as many applicants noted have, has the potential to dramatically uh, disrupt and improve project economics for uh, retrofit projects, uh, potentially providing wealth building opportunities uh, for, uh, for homeowners. Uh, and then finally, um, we saw, I think, very thoughtful consideration of the um, embodied carbon in proposed building materials which we believe uh, will help raise awareness among builders, homeowners, and policymakers, uh, showcase um, best in class um, building materials uh, with embodied carbon in mind, but also highlight the need for a greater innovation uh, in this space. And of course, one of the greatest examples of that is that the blowing agents used in spray foam are, are pretty big offenders with regard to um, global warming potential. So if I could kind of summarize all of that, um, you know, perhaps the key takeaway um, for me anyway, and we'd love to hear um, what the key takeaway uh, was for all of you, um, is that I think there's broad recognition that triple deckers have been a really important part of our urban landscape um, across multiple um, Massachusetts and indeed New England uh, cities and towns for, for well over a hundred years. But if they're to remain relevant, and I think um, uh, echoing Kevin's remarks, I think he did a great job of, of highlighting this. If they're to remain relevant, uh, affordable, healthy buildings uh, and key community and housing assets over the next century, we'll need to identify cost-effective retrofit approaches that are also aligned with our climate objectives. Um, otherwise, many of these beloved structures will become um, climate liabilities. So I, I really wanna thank all of um, the applicants uh, because you brought us one step closer um, throughout this challenge to realizing that, that really important goal. And we'll continue to learn um, with you, from you, uh, with the community. Um, we do plan to um, uh, develop a white paper of, source, uh, of sorts that summarizes um, our findings. Of course, in the future, we'll be announcing uh, the winners of the challenge. Uh, and I would again uh, urge all of you to vote for um, uh, the People's Choice um, Award. Um, I, I just wanna end uh, by again, acknowledging and thanking our judges, um, thanking uh, Jenny and the BSA for your wonderful partnership on this event. And finally, um, my wonderful uh, colleagues and team on this at MassCEC, uh, Jacqueline, Bev and Peter. Um, with that, I would actually invite them uh, to jump in if I've forgotten anything or if there's anything that you want to add, uh, I know we have a few minutes left, um, so please jump in now if there's if there's anything that uh, I've missed. Just add a quick thank you to the Bar Foundation who uh, provided us a grant, which is helping fund the prizes.
And uh, I'll point out also that the, um, yeah, the link here has to be lowercase. I had a couple of people pointed that out in the chat and that'll get you to the link. Uh, you could also just type in mass DC triple decker challenge and you'll be able to find the link with the posters in more detail, but, um, but yeah, great comments overall, Galen. I, you know, I'm excited that they're, they're uh, what we've seen demonstrated is that there's a pathway forward to getting these buildings to being where we need to be by 2050 and doing it in a way that can save tenants money um, and uh, reach our climate goals in the meantime. Great. Well, thank you all for your time and attention. Please feel free to contact any of us if you have questions about the challenge, if you want to interact with us on the, um, the kind of technical and substantive issues that have, that have come up tonight. Uh, and uh, I do see a question about when the winners will be announced. Um, TBD, um, hopefully this quarter, um, but uh, we can't make any promises. Um, thank you so much for your time and attention, um, and please stay safe and healthy, and uh, really appreciate you participating this evening. Thanks, everyone.